All right, we are live. Hello, Seminole State family. This is Nicole, joined by the my ever faithful colleague, Claire A. Miller. Thank you, Claire, for joining us today. Absolutely, Nicole. This is something I'm really passionate about, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Awesome. And we also have our wonderful colleague, Kelly Diaz, down below here for moral support. Also, keep an eye on us in case we forget to include any juicy details. Hi, Kelly, about these forbidden, caution, read at your own risk books that we're going to talk a little bit about today. The libraries are um, on fire this week because this is one of our special weeks. It's Banned Books Week. It began yesterday. This is an annual event. It is um, sponsored by ALA, the American Library Association, and uh, has a lot of other partners. And it is a big deal because this is the week that we like to focus and talk about books that have been banned or challenged or, or challenged it's really important to remember that or challenged because as we were discussing earlier nicole most books are not actually in the end banned thanks to people who are passionate about the freedom to read librarians and even sometimes faculty and staff yes now of course seminole state college uh, we're an academic institution, and luckily only about 2% of reported cases of challenges uh, are at academic academia institutions. Most of them are at public libraries, that'd be about 66%, and then uh, school libraries following up with about 19% of reported cases. So we don't really see a lot of challenges come in at Seminole State College and other colleges and universities don't really see that many. Of course, we're institutions of higher learning. So preventing people from accessing different ideas and information that would kind of that does go against the idea of learning more, uh, seeing what's out there in the world, who thinks what all the different viewpoints, right. And we were talking a little bit about before that because um, you know, if you if you're insulted or offended or you prefer not to access certain content on any media, books or otherwise, you're welcome to use your own discretion and avoid that, right, Claire? Absolutely. And I think yeah. that that is ultimately the the question about banned books. Well, why would somebody want to ban a book? They could just not read it. And there are all kinds of reasons why people might want to ban or challenge a book. But ultimately, I think that that is a personal choice we all have is what media we consume, we can just step away from something we don't want to read. Mm -hmm. um, now, Banned Books Week is, once again, it happens, it's annual. So it happens towards the end of September every year. And just to give um, a little bit more frame of reference, because these are some things that as librarians we're pretty familiar with, um, it's not very old. It started in the early 80s. Okay, so there was a huge Supreme Court case in 1982, Island Tree School District versus Pico. You could Google it if you are interested in the details. And basically the, out, that, the outcome of that case was that um, it was decided that the school board and that particular district could not, because they wanted to, they wanted to take certain materials out of the school library because they, some people, parents complained they were offensive or inappropriate for children. Um, and it was ruled that the school board could not just, uh, you know, without a very thorough investigation about the material itself, like in depth, they couldn't just take material out. So that was a big deal. That was one of the first um, times that that, that case, uh, that type of verdict was came through. Um, right. And we'd had plenty of censorship of books before that. Let's be clear. Right. There were whole kinds of books that were not allowed to be published in the United States. Right, Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence was not allowed to be published in the United States for years and years and years. And when it finally was, that took a court case too. So, so censorship existed long before this court case. This was where we sort of saw the tide turning to allow more access. Yes, yes. Um, now, Claire, um, if you saw the a reminder announcement about our uh, live meeting today, she had a, was holding a book by uh, Sherman Alexie, which we did provide a link to a search results list because the libraries, the Seminole State Libraries, multiple campuses, we do have other material by this famous author, 
whose book is consistently for the past few years has been at the top of the list, right? Yeah, it's made the top 10 for basically since it was published. So this book is The Absolute Truth, Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie. Now, Sherman Alexie has run several other um, awards. This particular book won the National Book Award. That is a big deal. Um, but none of his other books had really made the list previous to that. Uh, and I think the big difference is that this was a young adult book. It was, it was marketed towards young adults. Mm -hmm. And it's a really frank and amazing look at the life of one boy who lives on an Indian reservation in Spokane, Washington, and who decides that he is going to go to a nearby, mostly white high school. And there's a long story about why and how that impacts him and how that impacts his family. But that is, that is the basic story of the book. Now, it gets challenged pretty frequently. Some people are upset because it turns out, Nicole, you're gonna be shocked, teenage boys curse and think about girls and occasionally masturbate. Okay. I know, we're all, we're all shocked. This is something we never, but when, when somebody sees it written down, they can get very uncomfortable. And there is something, some people really get uncomfortable with a book and they feel like no one should read this book. Not just, I don't want to read this book and I think I'll not choose to do so, but no one should read this book. Okay. And, and speaking of that, um, that I got banned for that reason, uh, of course, that's part of his, uh, okay, in building the character and building the story uh, and characterizing a teenage boy, those those were impor important topics to weave into the storytelling. And we talked a little bit about this before we went live is um, it's usually not most, I mean, most of the time, not gratuitous or uh, superfluous, like uh, meaningless uh, addition of some kind of tantalizing topic. It usually threads into character development, the story development, or literally maybe if it's a nonfiction book, like telling what really happened, right? It's Absolutely. not like shock for the sake of shock or, you know, and I think that's an important thing to bring up because like you said, if there's like, oh, there's this book and it has these topics. And I was like, well, I have a young son and he's going to be a teenager in a few years. And oh, oh my, like, you know, but it's like, how is that topic used? Is it you know, it has a meaning, it has a purpose. It's not necessarily there just for shock value. And I think that's an important thing to think about when you hear about a book being banned or challenged, look further into it. Like really why, you know, how much is that topic used and in what context? Context. And in what important. context? Yeah. So actually that's a great transition, Nicole. I want to bring up a favorite children's book. Probably a lot of us have read In the Night Kitchen by Marie Sindak. So Back in 1982, when Banned Books Week started, this was one of the first books that made the top 10 Banned Books list that year. Do okay. you know why? Do you remember? I do. Um, is it because the little guy in there is naked? Yep. So there's that moment where he's being mixed into the cake batter, and he finally gets out of the cake batter. Right? He's built his airplane. He's flying through the kitchen. He falls into the milk. Right, he falls into the milk. Let's see if I can get the, the computer to cooperate here. He falls, he falls into the milk, and as he falls into the milk, his dough pants come off, and you can see that he has external genitalia. And this was a huge issue. So apparently a lot of um, teachers and librarians would actually paint over it. They would add on pants or they would add on a diaper or something like the idea that a kid could be naked was just crazy. Now, let's also point out that this book won the Caldecott Award. That's the highest award available for children's literature illustration because of these stunning illustrations and how beautiful they are. And when did it win? Uh, how many years after its initial publication did it win that award? The I think it won the Caldecott the year it came out, but I'd have to double okay. check that. 
Okay, but yeah. probably usually a book gets that pretty shortly after it's first. Yeah, published, it, right? it, they're, they're by year. So the year it comes out, they're either awarded or not the Caldecott Award. Okay. Well, um, since we are, you, uh, this is another great segue. We're really segueing nicely today, Claire. Um, I, my share today was Shel Silverstein, A Light in the Attic, and Where the Sidewalk Ends. Okay, so these are kids' books. Um, they're poetry books. And for anyone that's not familiar, um, whether or not you have kids, um, I think these books could be enjoyed by anybody, uh, children and adults alike. Um, they're very clever, funny. And yes, a lot of these poems in uh, these books by Shel Silverstein are subversive. Uh, now, on the topic of discretion, um, you know, these books, I actually started recently reading them with my son, who's almost nine, um, as a way to practice reading. And uh, I don't think I would have read a lot of these poems. And there's some poems I skip over with him. And that's based on my discretion as a parent, I, I, knowing his age, his temperament. Um, you know, there's some poems in here that, here, well, some of them are very whimsical, like here's a poem about, you know, catching a star with a net. And I remember being a kid and being fascinated by uh, the whimsy of these um, poems and also the illustrations. Oh, they're beautiful illustrations. And they're also like at times very uh, um, grotesque. Like there is a picture of a girl that's jumping into a pool that ends up having no water. Um, where's this other one? Uh, you know, like stuff like this guy, he has no knees. I mean, and then there's one in here where someone's like a man and a guitar. I really want to show this one because this one kind of uh, exemplifies most of the drawings in these poetry books. <laughs> Look, and there's a butt. Okay, and I just remember being completely fascinated by um, just the drawings themselves and um, one of the poems in here and the A Light in the Attic book, uh, because A Light in the Attic and Where the Sidewalk Ends are two of his most famous poetry books, if I can find it here, is a poem about um, if you, how to not have to dry the dishes. Now this poem I'm about to read right here was actually used to uh, um, justify a challenge to have this book <laughs> removed from, I'm sure, public libraries, school libraries, because it encouraged disobedience and um, violence. Uh, okay, so how not to have to dry the dishes. And here's the picture right there of the child that would rather not wash the dishes. If you have to dry the dishes, such an awful boring chore, if you have to dry the dishes instead of going to the store, if you have to dry the dishes and you drop one on the floor, maybe they won't let you dry the dishes anymore. <laughs> so that right there, that little one. Um, so that's just another example. Now, I don't think I would have read that poem to my son once again using this example. It's discretion. If he's old enough, he's been taught the rules and that he definitely should not drop the dishes and he's going to get in trouble for doing that. I could read him the poem. He'll appreciate um, kind of uh, experiencing that naughtiness without actually yes. doing something wrong. And I think everyone, young and old alike, we are captivated by something naughty or something we know. Titillating, yeah. Something a little outside the ordinary. Yeah, and we get delight from almost maybe experiencing or just kind of thinking about it through literature, through nonfiction, poems, whatever it may be. And I think that's also at the crux of um, the issues with banning and challenging books is that, uh, you know, you don't want to walk too far away from being able to experience those things. It has value for young and old alike and all of the different forms that um, challenging material exists. Yeah, well, that's a great Great segue again, Nicole. So that was kind of my next, um, I have actually two books here. These are both graphic novels. I have Persepolis, Story of a Return. Um, I'm sorry, this one is Story of a Childhood. Um, Persepolis has been banned once again, basically since it was published. Uh, okay. But it really kind of hit a point in 2013 where it attracted a lot of attention. 
And as you guys may recall, 2013 was when the so-called Arab Spring really kind of got up and running. There were a lot of movements for popular democracy in the Middle East. And Persepolis is the story of one girl who is growing up in Iran before the religious takeover, right? And this is to most Western readers, or at least here in the US, maybe a part of history that they aren't taught in school. Certainly I didn't learn about it in school, right? I read this book and it opened my eyes to an entirely different culture and world and a piece of history that I hadn't heard about or experienced. And I think there's some real value to that. Now it's not always an easy book. Um, it, is, it is made of beautiful, beautiful art, but I mean, it's the story of a family trying to, let's see if I can get this to work here, maybe not. Uh, it's a story of a family trying to survive a religious coup and they eventually end up going to America and they kind of don't know what to do. And eventually as an adult, there's a sequel where Marjorie Santrapi goes back to Iran as an adult and kind of talks about how weird and bizarre an experience is to have this home that is totally different than the childhood she remembers. Oh man, wow. Got and, and on a similar note, let's talk about one of the great ones that keeps coming up, right? Mouse. You guys familiar with this one? Nicole, have you read this one? I, I am not. Okay, so this is, as, as you may notice by the swastika on the cover, this is a story of World War II. Specifically, it is a cartoon story of World War II told through animals. So the Jewish people are portrayed by mice. The German people are portrayed by cats. Um, various other ethnicities are portrayed by other animals. And in some ways it's interestingly stereotypical, right? The French people in the story are portrayed as frogs. Okay. But it's a really dark comic because Art Spiegelman, the man who wrote it, wrote it based on his father, finally, after years and years and years and years, talking about what happened when he and his wife were in the concentration camps. So it's the story of them trying to escape Germany, getting caught, going to the concentration camps, and what happens afterwards. And so you go back and forth between these vignettes of modern day, right? The father, who's very elderly, and his son, who's trying to get him to talk about this experience so that he can make art about it. Mm -hmm. And the father kind of wanting nothing to do with it, but he's starting to be willing to tell that story. And then flashing back in time to the 1940s when all of this is happening. And it is beautiful and gorgeous and heart-wrenching and terrible. And it was really the first book that I read as a child that really talked about what the Holocaust was and what it meant. Um, and as a result, it is one of those books that I keep around, even though it's hard to read. Okay. Wow. I, I, I hadn't heard of that. I'm glad you enlightened me because I, I'm going to look into that. That sounds fascinating. So it actually won a Pulitzer Prize in, a, okay. in addition to an Eisner. Eisners are for comic books, but Pulitzer Prizes are for reporting. And they actually gave this a Pulitzer Prize for reporting huh. because it wow. is a nonfiction book. Wow. Well, um, these are these are some really good selections that we found today. Thank you so much. I knew I could count on Claire to bring it. I knew she'd bring something quality. Um, so we're uh, going to wrap it up now um, in a few minutes. Um, so basically, if you hadn't already noticed, Claire has this awesome background uh, yes. for her Zoom. And this week, um, I'm going to post the photo on Facebook. So if you want to download that picture, and take a picture of yourself with your favorite band book and post it back up to our Facebook. You're welcome to do so. Also throughout the week, we're going to have watch party events. We're going to link to live events that are occurring uh, in, in celebration of Band Books Week if you'd like to partake in those. Also- There's gonna we, be a concert, isn't there, Nicole? Well, you know, I looked further into that event. It sounds like I can't tell from the full description if they're actually going to play music, but I'm guessing Portugal, the man, if they're there talking about banned books and how they helped a school district in Alaska get free copies of banned books that were ripped out of the high school library, they're going to, that was part of their, why they got involved with this. 
Um, I'm assuming at some point they're going to at least do one song. Like, how could they not, <laughs> right? How could they not? Uh, but it doesn't say that explicitly. So just putting that out there. Um, and that's tomorrow night. And there's something on Friday night, um, Scary Stories, which is a throwback. You remember those books? I they do were kind of like an 80s, stories. 90s thing. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the author of George, um, I want to say one of the t most banned books of the past year or two. Yeah, that was all the top 10 for this Legos. year and last year. Okay. Alex Legos, I believe. Alex. Okay. Uh, that's an event for Wednesday. So we'll post about that. We're also going to post some links to banned books or challenged banned books that we have in our library collections that you can either access with an ebook or a um, put a hold on to come pick up the physical book. And I'm sure we might be able to find something in Flipster, hunt down some things for you and put them We're out. We're going to have audiobooks too, banned and challenged audiobooks. We're working on getting that together. We'll have it up before yeah. the end of the week. So we'll pepper it throughout the week so just stay tuned and um thanks again Seminole State family for joining us and thank you so much Claire A. Miller for Absolutely. joining us today can we end on a high note I don't want to end oh on please I want to end oh on please <laughs> all right so I have here and Tango Makes Three which is my absolute favorite book about penguins uh, okay there aren't that many books about penguins but it's still my favorite one um, it's actually a really wonderful story about making a family by choice. Uh, and Tango Makes Three is a story about two penguins who adopt an egg that another penguin had rejected. And in a move that baffles me, uh, but makes some people very uncomfortable, it turned out that the two penguins who adopted this egg were both boy penguins. So uh, the, the three penguins, uh, they, the two males incubate the egg. They successfully hatch the egg and the egg is named Tango. And it's a really beautiful heartwarming story. It's um, co-written by the zookeeper who was actually there for the whole thing. And you get to see them making a super cute little family. Um, and one of the things that always kind of makes me, makes me giggle is that People are like, well, well, how could they, how could they show that, you know, agenda? I'm like, guys, it's penguins. They're adorable. There's no agenda. These are just penguins. It's fine. And, uh, you know, we might actually have that book in the library collection. I believe so we do. I will take a look at it and see if people could come and pick it up. But yes, heartwarming story about penguins. If the college library isn't accessible to you, check out your local public library. Mm -hmm. Um, it's super cute. It's entirely family friendly for all ages and the illustrations are really beautiful as well. All right. Thanks, Claire. And thank you again to our Seminole State family for joining us. We will see you on the next one. Bye and be well. Goodbye. Oh, and bye. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs>